So my name is Hao Tin, and uh, uh, today uh, I, I will describe uh, the topic about uh, when, me um, when medical challenges meet uh, modern data science. And uh, yep, so let's start. Uh, first, I will start from this uh, example. Uh, this is called the photoplasticmography. I want to quickly introduce you what medical data look like, and uh, so that you uh, can somehow appreciate the difficulty of this kind of although those data are everywhere and every day you can collect them. So this uh, photoplasticmography uh, uh, signal uh, can be easily collected. It has been widely used in medicine since 1960 and so on, maybe even earlier. Okay, and uh, its mechanism is very simple. You can emit a light, a white light, of, through your finger or your nail or through your, your earlobe, and uh, the light will go through uh, you go through your vessel, and inside your vessel, there are hemoglobins. And hemoglobins will contain different, uh, different amount of oxygen uh, during different uh, cardiac cycles. So when you record the reflected light and you do a comparison, somehow you can see the oscillation of uh, the changes of the, oxyg of the oxygen content inside your blood. Uh, and this is normally how the machine looks like as a PPG machine. And normally, this is how the signal looks like. As you can see, this signal, well, is uh, kind of uh, funny. It seems to have some kind of fast oscillation and some kind of slow oscillation. And if you pay some, uh, pay some attention, you will see that on the left-hand side, the oscillatory pattern and is different from the oscillator, uh, oscillatory pattern on the right-hand side. And physiologically, we have known that uh, there's quite a lot of different uh, clinically useful information you can acquire from this signal. For example, the heart rate or pulse rate variability, blood pressure, respira even respiration, and so on and so forth. It has been widely applied. And what is the respiration? It's quite simple, actually. You see there is a kind of a slow varying oscillation that is actually respiration. And uh, the fast varying spikes are the uh, cardiac cycles. Okay, uh, PPG signal is not just uh, commonly seen in the hospital. Right now, nowadays, it is commonly seen uh, everywhere. Probably some of you wear eye watch. So if you have eye watch, or when you exercise, you, you have some phoebe, then somehow this kind of signal is recorded. And even if you take your, iPhone, if you take your iPhone, in your iPhone there is a, a video a function, it can take the video of your face. And from your face, actually we can even understand how your heart beats, how fast your heart beats, and so on. Let's take a look at the signal, how the signal looks like. If you take the iPhone, just take the iPhone and take the video and, uh, and record your face, then this is how the signal looks like. You can see, hey, there is some kind of oscillation, although it is more noisier. Uh, more noisy and uh, there are some kind of, uh, well, something seems a bit weird, which is hard to say. And if you are running, and this is how the, how the running signal looks like. If you ever handled any time series data, you may wonder, hey, how does it look like? And this is the challenge you are facing if you have interest in time series, in statistics, in doing any kind of data, because this is the data you collect every day. The second example I want to share with you uh, is called fetal electrocardiogram example. So female, uh, <laughs> females uh, get pregnant, uh, and uh, uh, before due, uh, we can uh, somehow put uh, the electro electrolyte on the abdomen. Okay, and if you put an electro uh, uh, ECG, uh, ECG electrode uh, lit on, on the female's abdomen, uh, somehow you can record two different kinds of electrical ac activities. The first one is maternal cardiac activity. Another one is fetal cardiac activities. Okay, so I claim that this recorded ECG signal contains not only maternal ECG signal, but also fetal, fetal ECG signal. And what do I mean by it? So if you pay attention, you will see that, hey, there are some small spikes here. They seem to be noise. But I say, no, they are not actually not noise. They are actually fetal ECG. And how can, I, how can I be so sure that this is fetal ECG? Okay, to some extent, we have some advanced technology 
to really acquire fetal ECG, contact fetal ECG, and how do we do it? Like uh, after the, the cervix uh, open or the membrane, uh, membrane rupture, uh, we can put a lid through the vagina to touch the fetal uh, scalp. And this direct contact ECG signal can record fetal ECG. And this is how the fetal ECG looks like when you record simultaneously from uh, the, field, uh, the fetal's, uh, fetal's uh, scalp. And if you do a comparison, hey, all those spikes, spike, spikes, they match exactly. So what I want to show you here is now for the maternal abdominal ECG signal, it contains not just maternal ECG signal, it also contains fetal ECG signal. The question for you is, could you decompose these two signals for me so that I can understand or I can study the fetal, uh, uh, fetal's heart uh, uh, health, healthness or something, whatever you want to do. Uh, and actually, there are quite a lot of applications. For example, uh, before the delivery, uh, we can use the heart rate variability, the fetal's heart rate variability or fetal's heart uh, ECG signal to study intra, this IUGR intra uh, uterus uh, growth uh, retardant, or fetal acidemia, and several clinical problems. Um, which I may not, I won't, don't worry, I won't discuss it today here. Okay, so the mission for you is now there are some kind of uh, interesting time series which you can collect easily and uh, which contains uh, quite a lot of uh, clinical information. What can, how can you do the analysis? Okay, so I will uh, go through the analysis with you uh, with uh, these four kind of items. The first one is the model. The second one is the algorithm, and the third one is the uh, kind of the single source, single channel source, prime source separation problem, and which the manifold model and uh, this uh, non-local uh, Euclidean mean, uh, this uh, manifold learning uh, business will come into play, and uh, I will show you some application results. Okay, uh, the model. The first model is uh, the model is called adaptive harmonic model. And uh, if you think about it, uh, there are some kind of common ingredients in the signals we saw before. The first component is the frequency actually doesn't, is not constant. The frequency changes from time to time. Well, to appreciate it, you may need some physiological background, but uh, uh, the frequency does change. Second, the amplitude does change. Third, there may be some kind of uh, trend whatever you define it, some kind of slowly varying, locally seen trend, and the noise, inevitable noise. So how can I quantify those things to model the, the, the signal I saw before? Okay, so this is the model we proposed uh, starting from 2011, and we used it, uh, and we had some uh, theoretical results regarding it. But anyway, this is how it looks like. You have the Y, which is the observed signal, and this signal is composed by some summation of K uh, formula and the T and the sigma. And what are they? First, this AI is a positive function, which we call amplitude modulation, which changes slowly. That's our assumption. We say, well, physiologically, uh, the, the system is not crazy, so it doesn't change uh, crazily. Second, this phi is a monotonically increasing function, so that phi prime is positive, and we call this uh, phi, I, the phase function, phi I prime, the instantaneous frequency. And we also made some assumptions saying that the instantaneous frequency changes slowly. And if you think about it, if you think about it, suppose this AI is constant, really constant, it doesn't change at all, and this phi I is a linear function, then what do you get? You get the, the, the traditional, ordinary harmonic function. So to some extent, this function, this model, captures the fact that the signal locally will oscillate like a harmonic function. That's, the, that's our model. And uh, we call this uh, component the intrinsic mode type function. Uh, well, it doesn't really mean anything, but just a name. Okay, and this T is the trend, which will assume the trend will change local, slowly, locally and you can view it as a locally DC turn, kind of just like constant. 
Okay, and the fee is a stationary noise, and you can choose to be arma, choose to be gauge, and so on. And sigma is something we want to use to catch a non-stationarity. And the mission for you, as a statistician, mathematician, whatever, no matter who you are, the mission for you is, now I have one realization of y. Could you decompose this realization y to get a phi t sigma phi for me? Because everything contains information. Everything contains information. And we want to understand what's really going on. OK? However, this is not really the right model for the signal I shared with you. And why isn't it correct? Let's take a look at this uh, ECG signal, electrocardiographic signal recording procedure in the bedside. Uh, I don't know, maybe some of you already uh, uh, well, experienced such a, uh, such a procedure. But anyway, um, uh, you lie on the bed, and uh, the lid put on your chest, and you record signal, and so on. Whatever, no matter what it is, I will give you a 30 seconds quick review about what the ECG is. ECG is nothing, nothing but viewing your heart activity, your heart activity as a dipole current. This, as the, and the dipole current is the accumulation of your electrical activity inside the heart, and you use one three-dimensional trajectory to describe it. And uh, you project it, these uh, current dipole loops, into some pre-designed directions. You project it to some pre-designed directions. That is the ECG signal you get. That is the ECG signal you get. And this is how the ECG signal looks like. And as you can see, hey, it is oscillatory. I think our, our perception will tell us that is oscillatory. But uh, it is not really cosine, isn't it? And this your definition of cosine is different from mine. It is not cosine. At least I don't think it's cosine. OK. So, and then what's wrong with what's what's wrong if it is not cosine? Oh, we can still live with it, right? Oh, okay. And then we have to talk about what are we reading from the ECG signal. Then some clinical knowledge comes into play. On the left hand side, this is how the physician, how a physician read the ECG signal and do a diagnosis and tell you if you, uh, your heart is healthy or not, or if you have some trouble. What the, he reads is how one oscillation looks like. For example, this is a typical STEMI a situation indicating you have myocardial infarction. You see, the morphology of one oscillation is different. That's what a physician reads. And this is how a physician was trained to read your ECG signal. However, however, the instantaneous heart rate or the fast, fast, slow, slow, this kind of time varying heart rate also, include, also contains a lot of physiological information, which is called heart rate variability. And this is, can be quantified by something called instantaneous frequency. OK, so if I give you such a signal, somehow how you oscillate or this oscillatory pattern and the instantaneous frequency should be separated, because they contain different information. So let's come back to adaptive harmonic model. I already told you it is maybe not that good. So what do we want? We want to consider some kind, something called wave shape, which is non-sinusoidal, because the oscillation pattern is not sinusoidal. And how do we do it? We simply replace the cosine by a one periodic function, by a one periodic function. And we call it adaptive non-harmonic model. And this is one example. With the same amplitude modulation, and instantaneous frequency, but different sinusoidal oscillation. Non-sinusoidal oscillation, sorry. And the mission is, again, uh, to decompose e each component from Y uh, for me. And you can consider more delicate model, but I, just, I think it's, uh, I'll skip it. I only have 14 minutes. OK, so now we have a model to describe the recorded signal. We now have a model. Then what can we do about this model? What can we analyze? What can we, what can we do? How, which kind of information can we extract from it? Uh, the algorithm we propose is called uh, D-shape, uh, short-time Fourier transform. D-shape, short-time Fourier transform, which can be viewed as a nonlinear version of 
the widely applied short time Fourier transform, or maybe in some fields it's called Gabor transform or window to Fourier transform. Okay, um, and uh, some kind of uh, engineer's term called Captron will come into play. And if you ever learned uh, signal, digital signal processing up to the last chapter, maybe you, you, you saw this kind of uh, Capstone stuff. And uh, now the question is, how can you combine these two things? OK, so I, wa I want to share with you, I want to show you the algorithm using this simple example. This simple example. OK, this example is only one single component, uh, component signal. And uh, the, the frequencies are actually constant. The fundamental frequency is constant. But uh, the amplitude changes. And if you take a look, this signal oscillates twice per second. Twice per second. So the fundamental frequency is 2 hertz. 2 hertz. OK, remember this. 2 hertz signal. And it's non-sinusoidal oscillation. And I want to extract some information out of it. OK, first step. If you get a time series and you really don't know what to do, short time Fourier transform is your best friend always. Mm, not really always, but uh, quite a lot of time. Right? You can always say, hey, I have a function f. You take a window, for example, Gaussian window, h, and you mount the Gaussian window at time t, and you get a crop of the signal, and you evaluate, it, you evaluate its Fourier transform. OK, and sure, if you take the absolute value square, then you get the power spectrum. Or people call it the spectrogram, whatever it is. And uh, if, you take, if you take a look at uh, this signal, it oscillates twice per second. So somehow, in the frequency domain, at each time, you will get 2, 4, 6, 8. And why do you, why do you get, get so? The 2 is the fundamental frequency, and this 4, 6, Eight comes from the non-sinusoidal oscillation. For a one periodic function, you can always, always represent it as a summation of the cosine function, but with the multiple frequencies. And this is what you see here. OK, this is step one. You get uh, this uh, fundamental frequency, and uh, it's multiples. Cosi, two Cosi, three Cosi, et cetera. OK, so now there is something kind of interesting here, isn't it? You see, in the frequency domain at fixed time, in the frequency domain, there is something oscillatory again. There is something oscillatory again, isn't it? Every 2 hertz, you get one peak. So there is something oscillatory. So a, a very naive idea is, how about if we do Fourier transform again? If we do Fourier transform again, because this Fourier transform may give us something, right? Because it's oscillatory in the frequency domain, the Fourier transform can give us something. So what you do is you take absolute value of VF, the short time Fourier transform, you take natural log, and you evaluate Fourier transform. And uh, you see this called frequency, and this is called Captron. And if you think about it, the interesting thing is, in the frequency domain, because every two hertz, you get one oscillation. So its Fourier transform will give you something like health. Health, health hertz oscillation. And what is the health, health hertz oscillation? Health hertz oscillation of the, in the frequency domain is equivalent to the period in the time domain. And the two, and the, uh, and the uh, health, <laughs> sorry, and the health, health, uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, in the health, uh, health in the time domain oscillation is actually the period of the oscillation. Because oscillation oscillates twice per second, so the period is health. Okay, so you get uh, something like uh, Q, which is a period, and uh, two period, and three period. Okay, and this is called uh, Capstrong, and this is or, or, in the, uh, or the y axis is called frequency. This is not a terminology invented by me. This uh, terminology uh, coined by uh, Turkey in 1963. And Captron is nothing but spectrum, and you reverse the consonant. And the frequency comes from you reverse the frequency consonant. OK, and why do you want to take the natural log? It's actually very simple. Taking natural log is just to conquer the issue 
of a very uh, of the varying uh, non-sinusoidal oscillation because the oscillation, the one periodic si uh, oscillation, can have different shape. So in the frequency domain, in the frequency domain, the amplitude may be very different. However, we can view this uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, varying varying amplitude as an envelope. And so if you view this as an as an envelope then it is becomes the multiplication of this guy and this envelope. So if you take natural log, somehow you separate them. And after step, doing the separation, this, uh, this uh, pure oscillatory part can give you all those uh, pe uh, period and these multiples. And this uh, amplitude will give you a very low frequency garbage, which you don't want. It's useless. Amplitude is, is useless. And then, we take a fundamental information or fundamental relationship in between period and the frequency. Period is the inverse of the frequency. Inverse is a, frequen a frequency is the inverse of the period. And you see this Q, 2Q. So if you take the inverse in the frequency domain, in the frequency domain, okay, you get a C, the fundamental frequency, and its divisions. And what is the common in between the short time Fourier transform and the inverse Catron? Only the fundamental frequency. So you do the multiplication, and you only get the fundamental frequency left. And so you can view this procedure as a nonlinear filtering technique for short time Fourier transform. And for numerical purpose, I mean, this is how the algorithm looks like. Uh, and for, for practical purposes, you may say, hey, this natural log is very unstable. Yes, it is very unstable. So in practice, what we do is we replace the natural log by the soft log. Because x to the gamma, when gamma is very small, can somehow use to approximate log, natural log. It's 1 minus x to the gamma divided by gamma will approximate well, natural log something. Yeah. <laughs> OK, that's the algorithm which actually uh, is quite simple, uh, very intuitive, but it does work. So I want to show you some simulation to convince you that it does work. OK, now you have uh, this uh, first component, second component, third component. All the components are oscillatory, but uh, are uh, osc oscillatory in a non-sinusoidal way. OK, and there are some, even some dynamics. So I sum them together and give you this signal. And now. As a data scientist, no matter who you are, I ask you, could you please help us to extract information from it? I can give you some conditions. We know that something are oscillatory inside. Could you please do something for me? OK. However, life is, is never easy. Like, nature is evil. Most of the time, you have noise. And this is the ARMA11 noise with the T4 uh, innovation process. And I sum them together and give this to you. Please do something for me. OK, first the attention, short time Fourier transform. As you can see, mm, quite complicated, hard to really do the interpretation. And there are several artifacts which I won't go into details, but it's not, de not easy to really do too much interpretation. However, if you just run, just run the D shape, the nonlinear filtering scene, I, introduced, that's what you get. You get three components. You get three components. And uh, these three components, as you will see later, they fit the instantaneous frequency ground truth precisely. And you can do something more. You can apply another nonlinear time frequency analysis technique. That is, you take the phase of the short time Fourier transform into account to modify to modify, to sharpen the time frequency representation, and you get three sharp knives, which I, I don't discuss short time for us, think for squeezing today. And the, the, the red knives are the ground truth, are the ground truth. So you can see that uh, they can be well captured. Uh, and we have a theoretical justification of why it works, and uh, it's interesting. Turns out uh, this uh, analytic number theory, which I <laughs> I thought I would never encounter it, pops out and come into the, the analysis of those Turin inequality. And with it, we can show that the algorithm is feasible and can give us something, something, uh, something uh, true. OK, so let's take a look uh, at uh, kind of uh, one 
difficult uh, signal I showed you before about a fetal maternal abdominal ECG signal. This is how the signal looks like. You can see it's quite complicated, and the red, line, red circles indicate the fetal heart rate, the fetal bit. Short time for a transform, as I promised, is difficult to read. What do you see? A lot and the noisy. Okay? Somehow, unless you know how to read it, you have ground truth knowledge, otherwise, it's almost impossible. However, if you run the shape, short time Fourier transform, then you get only two curves left. And uh, the above curve, if you superimpose, with the ground truth, because we, can, we have a simultaneously recorded fetal ECG signal, so we have ground truth. You can see that it is exactly recovered. And we have uh, the state-of-the-art results for fetal heart rate estimation in two benchmark databases. And now uh, we are collecting more data sets from the U of, U of Washington uh, and uh, doing some clinical trials, which I will int quickly introduce later. Okay. Now, the single channel brine source separation, which is kind of, uh, uh, it's a, just the brine source separation, but you only have one channel. But I give you some more information. That is, the, the signals are oscillatory. This is the signal. This is the information I give you. And to see if you can decompose the signal. OK. So let's see it, fetal ECG analysis. The goal is to get the fetal ECG signal. But however, up to now, I only gives you the instantaneous heart rate, the fetal heart rate, instead of the fetal ECG signal. They are different. So what can we do? It turns out to be a single channel brine source separation problem. So in the next slide, I will introduce the algorithm uh, in the manifold model. Um, OK, so please bear with me just for one minute or two minutes. Uh, so this is the ECG signal. Ab abdomin mater ma uh, it's a maternal abdominal ECG signal. And you can see that, that there's a maternal ECG, and the small spikes are fetal ECG. Now assume that we can remove the fetal ECG, and this is only the maternal ECG. You see there are some oscillations. And those oscillations somehow look similar, but they are different. They vary from time to time. Is a time variance uh, inform, it's, it's non sinusoidal and time varying. However, we know that although those maternal ventricular activities are time varying, but they cannot be too crazy. They cannot go crazy. They cannot go crazy because of some physiological homeostasis understanding or assumption. So we can somehow try to approximate or per per parameterize those oscillations by some kind of a base manifold, by a manifold which is low dimensional, which we don't know how it looks like, but it follows some rules, but just we don't know how it is. And how do we do it? We have a manifold, and all those uh, maternal, uh, so maternal ventricular activities are put in, the, in some way, distributed on the manifold in some locations, so that the bits, which looks similar, will be put together closer, but bits that look more different will be put farther Father and uh, those closed bits might not come from consecutive two bits. They may come from very far away two bits. But don't forget what we have is actually the abdominal maternal abdominal ECG signal, which is contaminated by fetal ECG, contaminated by those fetal ECG. Then what do we do? We will model those uh, fetal cardiac activity as the fiber structure. In a, in a differential geometry framework. And what do I mean by it? I will have a fiber attached to each maternal, acti maternal uh, ventricular activity. And uh, on this fiber, every bit, every bit represents the summation of the base bit and the fetal heart rate. And the mission is, if you are able to classify all the bits, all the bits in the maternal abdominal ECG signal so that those bits, they share the same maternal uh, ventricular activity. Then you can just apply median to get uh, uh, the maternal uh, ECG back. And this procedure is called non-local median, because all those bits 
they may be located on different uh, position in time axis. Okay, so this is the algorithm called non-local median. And there is a fundamental, there's a fundamental difficulty, difficulty which I don't discuss here. That is how do you determine the metric? How do you determine if two bits, they belong to the same bit, maternal bits? And the metric design is needed to do so, which I don't discuss here. Okay, and in this uh, fetal ECG application, L2 long is actually good enough. However, for others, like uh, F-wave analysis in atrial fibrillation, you need to do some more, sof some more for, uh, sophisticated metric design. Okay, and uh, the analysis, uh, the algorithm has the, some kind of uh, guarantees. Uh, we know what's really going on by applying in, uh, this manifold model, yes? You get uh, each bit, right? And for every bit, you just truncated it. Okay, and uh, for every bit, you just put it here. So you just truncate the ECG signal, you do a truncation into bits. Okay? Okay, so let's take a look at the, the results. First, for this uh, fetal ECG1, and yeah, we have some, uh, some clinical trials ongoing in Brazil and in UW. Uh, the algorithm is the following. So you have the ECG signal, and as I mentioned, you can run uh, the shape, short time Fourier transform, and then you extract uh, the maternal ECG heart rate, and then you apply the non-local median, and you, get, you can get uh, the maternal ECG signal and get something called the rough fetal ECG signal, which is good, but not that good. And we can improve it by running the same thing again. We can run the shape again and run the local median again and to get to the final fetal ECG, uh, fetal ECG signal. And this is the result. As you can see, if you know how to read ECG signal, you can see that QIS are kind of well, uh, well captured. The P wave is too small, which we don't expect. The T wave here is not uh, good enough because uh, the cardiac is issue, so we don't see the T wave here. But actually, quite a lot of uh, fetal ECG information can be recovered, and we can see that. Okay, and for the PPG signal, uh, uh, we have uh, also several other uh, clinical trials and things ongoing. Uh, so this is the signal you saw before. And uh, again, if you, sh you run short time Fourier transform, it's not easy to see what you get. There's quite a lot of junks. But if you run the shape, you see two nines. And the one nine is the respiratory signal. And the red one is the ground truth from a simultaneously recorded uh, capnogram which is represents the, res the respiratory signal. And another line, the upper line, fits the simultaneously recorded ECG signal heart rate. And this blue line is the five times of the respiratory rate, just to show you that this line is not the multiple of the, the, the base line. Okay, and we have a kind of a comparison with other works. Uh, since 2013, there are quite a lot of uh, papers discussing how to do the analysis. And I think uh, we might be the first paper that could claim to get instantaneous heart rate estimation. Um, in the following sense, in most of the papers, they estimate the heart rate over some scale. They take us, for example, 120 seconds window and the average and count how many bits are inside it. So this is the average heart rate issue, heart rate, uh, average heart rate uh, information. But we can calculate the instantaneous at each time, every time. And uh, you can see that uh, even, even with uh, the instantaneous one, the result is not worse than others. Okay, uh, and uh, the mini is actually quite good. And you can see that uh, uh, we can get the instantaneous heart rate up to the scale of 15 milliseconds, which we think is uh, good enough for several clinical applications, even if you just use uh, these uh, home, uh, home mobile devices. And there's some other, uh, uh, some other evaluations. And this is uh, when you are doing exercise. The signal is crazy enough. 
And if you run Showtime Fourier transform as expected, it's crazy enough. But by running the shape Showtime Fourier transform, you can recover the heart rate just exactly. Okay, and you can see uh, so still again a comparison with other 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 algorithms. Uh, our results seems to be quite good, and we have pattern of it. Uh, so. I mean, it's quite, I'm quite happy about it because there are some companies come to con contact me uh, to see if uh, there's a chance to really do something with it. Okay, uh, and this is the optional one, but I don't think I have time. But I just want to show you quickly that the same algorithm, the same framework can be applied to deal with the atrial fibrillation. Atrial, fibr atrial fibrillation is a common disease in elders. Uh, and uh, we want to ask, uh, and the, it leads to stroke easily. And so we want to ask, uh, for example, this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, mobile device uh, era, could we benefit a bit from, uh, from these devices and to prevent uh, stroke or to understand more about atrial fib treatment and so on? And uh, the challenge is, again, you have to do this spinal cell separation. Okay, and I won't go into detail, but uh, and here you have to do some kind of dedicated uh, metric design to take the rotation into account and so on. And then you can get uh, the result. And uh, again, uh, this is the result, but I won't go into detail. Just want to show you that uh, by using a new algorithm, I think we can get a more dedicated result compared with the traditional algorithms. Okay, and uh, this is the summary statistics and so on. Uh, well based on all the recognized uh, metrics, I think our result is kind of the best uh, up to now. So we have multi-center intercontinental study ongoing, and hopefully uh, next time I show up in front of you, I can have some good news for you to share with you and so on. So the summary is uh, this is a single channel brine source separation, and uh, it might have some, some potential for the Internet of Things uh, era. But who knows, maybe something better will come. And uh, nonlinear time frequency analysis and diffusion geometry are potential for such a kind of time series analysis, uh, kind of a new analysis approach. And uh, this is a machine learning, uh, many machine learning experts are here, so uh, somehow what I work on fits in the feature extraction part. And with the extracted features, you can, you can dump it into any kind of learning procedure you like and the chain, the artificial intelligence system you like, whatever you do. Oh, when we have some other applications and clinical trials, and uh, I, don't say any, I, don't, I don't discuss any theory at all today, but if you have interest, you are welcome to, uh, to check uh, the papers. And uh, the codes are available online, but uh, for some codes, as uh, well, for commercial, whatever, yeah, you can get it. Uh, I guarantee you can reproduce everything I wrote in a paper, but uh, okay, fine. Uh, alarm system, more clinical information, and so on. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>